All right, today we're going to be trying to answer a very interesting question, and that is what quantum volume is needed for fault tolerant quantum computing? Now, this is not a, a popular question per se. Um, it's not even a question that, that everyone might think makes sense. If you Google this, um, the closest thing you'll find, you'll find some random stuff, you know, semantically related to the concept. But the closest thing you'll find to the actual question itself, at least that I could find, is a quantum computing stack exchange post from four years ago um, that asks effectively this, what quantum volume is needed to represent a single logical qubit? Now we're going to be talking about fault tolerant quantum computing as a whole, not just a logical qubit. Um, and there's two answers to this from two very uh, respected members of the community, Craig Gidney and Paul Nation from Google and IBM respectively. Uh, in all honesty, neither of them really answered the question. Uh, so uh, I thought we'd uh, take a stab at it. Um, so quantum volume is very much a near term benchmark. It's something that all the quantum computing companies are reporting. And it's a tentative measure, shall I say, of recording all the information, the quality information of a quantum circuit. So basically, um, the way uh, uh, here, let me write this out. The way quantum volume works is basically you're saying, excuse me, how big of a circuit, a random circuit, uh, can I run on my on my quantum computer? and still expect to get good results. That's that's the answer. And uh, the circuit specifically is a square circuit. So if we have, these are the qubits here, these are, you know, the initial states, then we would have, you know, three layers here, because this is a three qubit circuit. So if we have n qubits, we have, uh, this is n depth, and this is in height. So that's our square circuit that we're running. So basically, what is quantum volume mathematically? We can define quantum volume. And of course, I will always link the original quantum volume paper. It's called Variation, sorry, Validating Quantum Computers Using Randomized Model Circuits, published October 11, 2019. And it is uh, defined in there as equation seven. And we have um, for whatever reason, this is not something I, I'm entirely sure of, but we have the log quantum volume is equal to the argmax, argmax of n here, where I just said what n is, uh, of the minimum of n or d of n, uh, where d is this, this is d of n. Um, and you might say, well, I just said we're running uh, square circuits, but uh, so D of N should always be N, right? But in the case that, excuse me, um, that uh, we have fewer qubits, right? Let's say I have 10 qubits, I can run an 11th circuit, 11 depth circuit, uh, then we're taking the minimum there, so it'd be 10, but then we can take the maximum. So if we have two qubits um, that we're running a circuit on and it works fine, we can do depth of two, then we do three qubits, we keep increasing basically until we have the maximum value. Um, and of course, this is the log. So we would say the quantum volume, this is, we can just call it log base two, it's identical up to a constant, is two to this arg max. Um, and that's why I'm always a big believer in just reporting the log quantum volume. It makes so much more sense because as you can see from the definition, quantum volume is always like you see these numbers oh record quantum volume 10,000 wow well it doesn't really you know the it creates a weird perception where the difference between a quantum processor you know you could have a difference of 10,000 in quantum volume and a difference of 100 million in quantum volume and these are both depending on you know the step right this is 2 to the 12th to 2 to the 13th. So this is a log QB of 12 to 13. And this is, I don't know, you know, 50 to 51. I, I don't know what the 2 to the 100 million would be. But uh, this isn't really what this is 
showing is that this is one qubit difference, basically one qubit, one depth difference. This is also one qubit, one depth difference. So this difference improvement in quantum volume, like, oh, we improved our quantum volume by 100 million. That doesn't really mean anything necessarily because it's log quantum volume that matters. Uh, so this is um, the formulation of log quantum volume that we're gonna be working in, but how do you actually compute this? Well, you tackle what's called the heavy output probability problem or HOP, heavy output probabilities. Uh, so basically, right, this is just some random circuit we made uh, that, and this is a limitation of quantum volume analysis is that we run it classically to compare the results. And that's how we're evaluating because we don't know, right? There's no implicit like algorithm we're doing here. This is just some circuit we're making, uh, random circuit we're making. So uh, what we do is we run it classically, we compute the heavy bit strings. So there's going to be uh, some bit strings that are more probable than others. Um, and the ones that are above the median are called the heavy um, bit strings. And so uh, if you look actually the, um, a random unitary, right? So if we have our zero input state, so this is one for however many qubits, right? This is our input state vector. So then if we have a random unitary, this is, I guess this would be actually on this side of it. So we have, row times column, right? But all of these values are zero. So all of these are gonna be zero, zero, zero. So basically what we're doing is just multiplying by the first row, right? Cause we do row of this matrix times column here, but everything outside of the first element is gonna be zero. So we just look at basically the vector of this unitary, which is mean for a random unitary, this is mean zero variance, I think one over N um, and, uh, you can do the math basically, and I'll link, of course, papers showing this, but what this uh, converges to, right? So then if we square it, we have the square of a Gaussian, which is approximately, right? Then we have some exponential distribution because this is the Gaussian squared. And then uh, this is called the Porter Thomas distribution. There's some other properties of it. This is, this is just sort of the base exponential. And so uh, the Porter Thomas distribution is sort of very important in this random circuit sampling world. And um, yeah, you can look up more about it, but basically all I'm trying to say is that we're, we have this probability distribution that follows an exponential and we're looking at the um, top half. So above the median uh, popular bit strings so we simulate it classically. We say, what are the top half most popular bit strings? And then we say, okay, simulate this on the circuit and let's look at the most popular bit strings. And we can see right away that heavy output is uh, intuitively right um, between zero and one, but we can narrow it down even more. Uh, if it's a random distribution, or sorry, not random, but a completely uniform distribution, which would be sort of um, the least informative distribution, uh, then we would expect uh, that the probability of being above um, the median is exactly one half. And if this is the perfect distribution, this uh, exponential distribution here, we can just do um, yeah, right over here, we can solve, right? We can do the integral from zero to N of E to negative X DX. We get this out. So you can see this will be, you know, uh, negative E to negative X plus one equals one half, right? This equals one half because median, we're looking for the median. Uh, and then we just say, you know, this is E to negative X equals negative equals one half. Anyway, you do this out, right? And you'll get that the medium value is the natural log of two. Uh, and so then we can say, okay, what's the expected value of um, 
finding uh, an, a value above the median, what, like assuming we have the exact optimal distribution. So for that, of course, you do natural log of two to infinity, and this is expectation value. So we have x e to the negative x dx, and I'm not gonna walk through this, but uh, when you do it out, you'll see that the expected value here, oh, that's weird, my mouse is glitching out. Uh, the expected value is one plus, oh, I should write this, one plus natural log of two over two. And this is like 0 0.85. Um, so you can sort of see, and uh, this is sort of the practical values that we would expect um, this to go between. So uh, yeah, that's, and, and then, oh, I should say that uh, heavy output probability quantum volume is like a success. Quantum volume, log quantum volume is a success for N if this is greater than two thirds. So this is of course 0 0.66 repeating. Um, so if this heavy output probability is greater than two thirds, then we have, we say check quantum volume achieved. And then we keep going until this heavy output probability is not above two thirds. Now, of course, this is limited. Um, practically to maybe like 30 to 40 qubits, depending on simulation methods. So um, naturally, this isn't going to scale to fault, you know, fault tolerant quantum computing. If we have millions of qubits, we can't do heavy output probabilities at large. So anyway, I've spent a a little bit of time that's what the quantum volume problem is and you'll see it a lot now um, for context the largest log quantum volume that i know of and correct me if i'm mistaken is 15. this is set by quantinium earlier this year or quantinium slash pretty sure it's just honeywell i don't know why it's called quantinium i think honeywell bought them uh, so this was achieved by honeywell uh, earlier this year. And that's to the best of my knowledge, the state of the art log quantum volume on it. And that's on an ion trap processor. Uh, so that's just gives you some initial context. Um, so you'll see this reported, of course, they want uh, the biggest number as possible to impress all the PR people. So you'll see this as two to the 15th, which is I don't know, 32,000 or something. So that's how you see it in, in you know, popular media, but really 15 is the number that matters. Okay, so now we have quantum volume done. That's a good overview. Basically, we need these heavy output bit strings for at least two third uh, probability of measuring and the optimal is 0.85 approximately. So now let's do a quick new page and why is my mouse? Oh, hold on, my mouse was stuck. There we go. So now let's just do a brief talk about fault tolerance quantum computing. And this is not something I'm a super expert on, so I'm not really gonna talk about it that much uh, because I really do not know a ton about it. So all I'm gonna say is that for doing fault tolerant quantum computing, uh, there's a variety of error correction codes and techniques that exist. And depending on the code used, there's different requirements. And the two main requirements that we need to keep track of, excuse me, are the, is the threshold and the qubits so and these are actually sort of related i shouldn't totally pose them as distinct so basically uh there's this idea that uh you need a certain error rate to be able to correct it because error correction is effectively uh removing or canceling out the errors faster than they occur but you incur a uh, you, you like error correction has a cost associated with doing it. Um, so like if you just took some system and did error correction on it, especially a few years ago, you would probably get worse results because you're doing a bunch of two qubit gates that are inducing more noise uh, and more noise than you're canceling out. So you have to have some level of quality in the uh, implementation so that you can actually get improvements by doing error correction. The other thing is qubits. This is, of course, depending on the type of code and, and uh, encodes a number of physical qubits into a, a single logical qubit or set of logical qubits. Uh, and this varies massively uh, from dozens to 
tens of thousands of qubits, depending on the type of code and depending on the threshold as well. Some of uh, I've seen some work that uh, links, you know, the lower th you have a minimum threshold of viability, but then beyond that, you can sort of say, you know, if I have if it's really bad, then it just takes more qubits to encode. Uh, so that's sort of the, what we're going to be thinking about here uh, is this threshold. So um, the question now becomes, okay, you said what quantum volume is, is this heavy outputs, and you've said the key thing with fault tolerant quantum computing is qubits, which of course are going to be so massive, like qubits are not going to be the defining feature just intuitively in this connection. It's going to be the threshold, which measures and also, it's the same thing, right? Threshold is sort of the quality of the operations. Quantum volume is another metric sort of for the quality of your quantum processor. So how do we connect uh, heavy output probabilities to thresholds? And so these are given often as uh, error rates. So you need an error rate, you know, or you can't have an error rate more than X or something. And so this might be, you know, 10 to the negative three or something, right? And so, uh, you know, this is, I am I just pulled these, these numbers from sort of the abstracts of papers. I'm not at all an expert on threshold theorems or codes or anything like this. So this is very much a heuristic. And if you know more, you're welcome to sort of <laughs> correct my uh, silly mistakes. But uh, intuitively, right, uh, heavy output probability, um, we can, there's an intermediate step here that, that makes sense, right? Heavy output probability is dependent on uh, the noise of the system. And uh, going directly from noise operations to heavy output probability seemed mathematically difficult. So I decided to sort of add an intermediate step of fidelity um, here. So going from noise to fidelity is pretty common. Um, and, and well established. You can see, for example, I found um, this is a good equation, right? We have for some noise uh, or for some fidelity, we can like compute the density matrix, right? So this fidelity to heavy output probability seems to make sense. We we have our density matrix. It's approximately this, uh, you know, ideal state times our fidelity alpha plus one minus this. Uh, I, uh, identity state. And this is, uh, by the way, I just copied this. This is equation two of the paper Fourier analysis of sampling from noisy chaotic quantum circuits. I will link it below. However, I didn't end up using this equation because to me, I was thinking, okay, we can get from noise to fidelity and we can get from fidelity to density matrices. So the noise to fidelity is seems straightforward. Um, the equation we're going to be using for this is equation, uh, and this is what we'll also see again later. So, um, is equation 19 of the paper characterizing quantum supremacy in near term devices. I'm not going to write down the equation right now because we'll talk about it more later. But we have a way to get from noise to fidelity easily. But now we need a way to get from fidelity to density matrices, which we have. Now we need a way to mathematically go from density matrices to heavy output probabilities. And this is where I'm like, this really seems possible, but uh, I'm a computer scientist. I am not a mathematician. So thinking about like, oh, there's probably some, you know, Gaussian, we have to do some Porter Thomas distribution, look at some Gaussian, take noise channels, expect like, ah, oh, okay, that's so much work. I bet there is a solution here, so there's a way to do it, and I bet I could just simulate it and approximate this correlation. <laughs> so that's exactly what I did. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be saying, okay, there's some noise, bingo. This leads to some fidelity, which I can then simulate and map this to heavy output probability. And this uh, error rate slash threshold goes to this noise. So now I have a connection between and heavy output probability goes to quantum volume. So I've now established a connection from quantum volume to error thresholds. So all that's left to do is plug it in and figure out what, 
what the results are. So without further ado, let me just move my little drawing utensil out. Let me now switch over to the code tab. All right, now we can see the code tab. And we are using Kiskit today because I have swiped a bunch of the starter code from the Kiskit textbook. Uh, this is from the measuring quantum volume part of the Kiskit textbook. I will, of course, link it below. Um, but the first part of the code, I just directly swiped because, you know, it's there. Uh, so anyway, we have our, you know, standard set of imports. We have heavy outputs. You can see this is where I took it from. Uh, we check whether the threshold is there, right? So we check whether this uh, heavy output is greater than two thirds. And there's just some adjustment for the uncertainty, right? Because we're sampling from shots. So uh, there's uncertainty there. And so that's just built in. That's what they're doing. Excuse me, right here. Um, and then we have our test quantum volume function. So what is this doing? This is where you can see um, what I'm going to be doing is I'm mapping, I'm creating some error. And then I'm mapping it to quantum volume. And so to do that, uh, we say that there's sort of a built in um, assumption right here, and that is what has noise. And so basically, I think for the sake of, you know, uh, granting the best looking light to uh, quantum computers, I'm assuming that the only thing with error, and I'll be going forward, the only thing with error are two qubit gates. What does that mean? We have perfect one qubit gates, we have perfect state prep, and we have perfect measurements, which of course is never going to be true. Uh, but the, comparatively, single qubit gates are really good. Measurement is okay and state prep while we're just preparing the initial state obviously you know there's some thermalization happening but um, I think it's an okay assumption um, at the very least it's beneficial towards quantum devices to assume that there's no noise but uh, C not noise I think that's you know they'll, they'll appreciate that so now uh, what are we doing we're creating uh, different amounts of error uh, that we then uh, keep track of the fidelities of. And then we simulate them and get the quantum volume. So without, um, you know, belaboring the point too much, you can see here that we uh, sort of edited this quantum volume function a little bit. We have our qubits, the circuits we want to run, how many shots and what noise model. We get the ideal probabilities and then we get the real results. So we simulate our noisy uh, circuit. Um, we get the result and we get the density matrix uh, that will be computing the fidelity with the state vector. We create our quantum volume circuits. Thankfully, Qiskit has a helpful uh, um, built-in you know, function for this. Uh, we iterate through all these circuits, we get the ideal probabilities, we get the um, ideal heavy outputs, we simulate the circuit, we count the heavy outputs, we check the threshold, um, we get the, you know, the percent uh, of these heavy outputs, and then we take the average over to fidelities because there's some number of circuits in here um, that, that might be slightly different. And so we are going to just average over these fidelities. Um, so then we return uh, our heavy output probability and our fidelity. And so what do we do next? We can see um, the goal here, remember, is to determine this relationship between fidelity and uh, heavy output probability. You might say, hey, wait, you're just doing a direct connection from error levels to heavy output probability slash quantum volume. However, I didn't want to limit, right? Like I want to say the arbitrary noise. So right now this is depolarizing error. I'm not assuming that depolarizing error is the source of error. 
in the fault tolerant quantum computer. I'm simply using depolarizing error to get lower fidelity circuits and then comparing fidelity to quantum volume. So this is why I'm not going directly from error to quantum volume because I, I want it to be sort of maximally general and not say, okay, for depolarizing error, and then you have that built-in assumption. No, I want to say, in general, I'm mapping fidelity, which we know about, and it has more abstract sort of um, representations uh, than just a certain type of error. So if we do this, we say, you know, 1,000 shots, 160 rep repetitions. Uh, we simulate this. This is extremely slow. Actually, I let this run overnight on my laptop. Um, the, the 10 qubit circuits are, are a real bear to run. Um, and then we can plot this and we see basically uh, outside of the three, that's a weird little one. There's a pretty clearly linear relationship between fidelity and heavy output probability. Um, we can just directly look at this relationship. Uh, specifically, we're just going to be looking at the 10 qubit example. Uh, and we get a, uh, a slope and an intercept for this um, for this relationship. And it's exactly uh, what we, or it's sort of what we would expect, right? The intercept is 0 0.5, which would be fidelity 0, right? And if we remember fidelity zero, if we have some sort of uniform distribution, um, then fidelity zero would be, um, you know, half of it would be above a medium. So this is sort of exactly what we expected. And of course the maximum, and this is, you might see it slightly above, that's just sort of a, um, a numerical uh, result or a result of just the numerics. You can see that the maximum is 0 0.85. So this is a nice, relationship we have here. So I don't know if this is actually, you know, you know, some mathematician might come along and say, hey, this is just an artifact of simulation. But until that time occurs, I'm going to say, I like these results. And we're going to operate on the assumption that they're at least somewhat accurate. Um, I would love to be able to derive this from uh, sort of just derive this mathematically, this, these relationships, but I don't really have the interest or time to do that. So then moving forward, we can see there's a very clear way to get from fidelity to heavy output probability, heavy output probability, fidelity, right? We have these two equations. So now what we're doing is we're taking um, equation uh, 19 from this characterizing quantum supremacy and near-term devices, which basically says fidelity is essentially the exponential of the negative sum of the error rates times the number of operations. So we have the one qubit error rate, the two qubit error rate, the initialization, the measurement errors times the number of times it occurs. So for example, um, these two would be the same number, assuming we initialize and measure the same number of qubits. And then this is the number of one qubit gates, and this is the number of two qubit gates. Now you can see, I just wrote a, um, a way to curry this function that says, FID function is just the fidelity for um, two qubit gates. It assumes there are zero errors in one qubit gates initial state prep or measurement. Um, so this takes uh, the number of, or sorry, this takes the, um, the error rate and the number of two qubit operations. So now what we're gonna do is we're just going to arbitrarily, and this is just an arbitrary error rate, right? This is an assuming depolarizing error. Um, we're just going to take an error rate, and this matches the reason, you can see this is the reason we're doing this, is not so it has to be depolarizing, but it can be general, which is like in these thresholds for fault tolerant quantum computing. Um, we have our um, error range, we're, we're going from 10 to negative 7.5 to 10 to negative 1.5. Um, we have, uh, our uh, errors that were, and this is the errors we're iterating over, we, and then we compute the maximum, right? We're, we have to compute the maximum for the log uh, quantum volume. So we start off with two, and then we say, wow, we can, you know, keep going. Um, the number of two qubit gates, because it's a square circuit, um, is going to be the log quantum volume divided by two. So the number of qubits divided by two, because there's one, connection between every pair of qubits times the log quantum volume times the number of qubits because it's a square circuit, right? So if we have 
four qubits, there's going to be four layers to the circuit. So we have to have four of these repetitions. And in each layer, because there's two qubits, uh, or there's four qubits, there's going to be two gates, one between qubits one and two, and two and three. Or sorry, one and two, and three and four. So then we can calculate the fidelity, right, of this operation. Then we can easily go from this fidelity to heavy output probability directly. That's why we did all of this to begin with. So we could just get the constants for this function. And then we say, is this less than two thirds? And so that's the point, right? We're gonna keep increasing this on quantum volume. That's the point at which we said, hey, wait, we're past it. We, this is no longer a viable heavy output you know, set. Um, so quantum volume is actually, was actually the last one. So um, what you can see here is that, uh, what you can see here is that uh, we are just incrementing after this. So if if it's less than, you can see I changed quickly. I realized I don't know why I was incrementing by two here. You can increment log by one. It doesn't change anything, but I just fixed that. Um, otherwise, it is a viable quantum volume. And then we increase and we see, is the next size viable? Um, this is some old code that I was just trying out. Um, so now we can see this relationship here. You know, if we keep if we do this and keep track of it, we can see uh, the error rate versus log quantum volume plot. Keep in mind, this is very important to note. This is a log log plot, not just log log in the sense that this is log quantum volume. But look at the axis. This is a log 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 plot, maybe. Um, but I'm just gonna say this is our basic unit, right? We're taking the log of this basic unit and plotting it, taking the log of this basic unit and plotting it. So it's linear in log log space. That's important. Um, and so what does this mean? This means that this is, uh, of course, an exponential, right? As soon as you, uh, because we're going to take the exponential of this, the exponential of this, you can see, actually, I can just plot this real quick. You can see it's a very sharp <laughs> exponential right here. Um, when I remove the, I remove these logs, um, but it's linear in this log log plot. So now we want to fit this. Of course, we want a general equation for this function. That way we can sort of see where different error rates fall on this quantum volume, because this is now what we want, right? This is the goal. We have error rates against quantum volumes. So if we know the error rates for different thresholds, we can say what quantum volume is required to achieve that type of fault tolerant quantum computing. So what do we do? I tried, this is just a, a numerical query. I tried a curve fitting and poly fitting, um, curve fitting. So poly fitting, I'm fitting the uh, flat line uh, or I'm fitting like the linear equation, uh, whereas curve fit, I'm directly fitting this sort of the log log curve. Um, I was just curious to see like which would work better. The SciPy fit works better. You can just see, you know, the SciPy fit is really good. This is all that's not really relevant to our results. That's just you know, a fitting intrigue. Um, so now what we're doing is we're going to plot this. Um, these uh, the quantum volumes the uh, and empirically calculated ones. And then we're going to plot, we're going to use this function that we, uh, this function that we fit to it to be able to calculate for an arbitrary uh, two qubit uh, error rate or arbitrary error rate. I don't know why this one says two qubit error rate. This is just error rate. Um, we're going, because remember, this is just an error rate that we're feeding into um, the equation. Now we are assuming only two qubits have errors, but in, in general, this is just the error rate we're, we're working with. Uh, and then we can use this function uh, with our fitted parameters to evaluate the results. And what you'll see here is I've picked out three papers. I do not know if they're representative samples. You are welcome to use these parameters. You could, there's just two parameters right here. Um, that you could, you know, you could write this function yourself. Of course, this code will also be uploaded. Um, and you could try your own favorite threshold code. Uh, 
And you can see, but I've picked out uh, three papers here that I found. Uh, the first one is the entitled Quantum Accuracy Threshold for Concatenated Distance 3 Codes, um, which gives a threshold of 2.73 times 10 to neg negative fifth. I picked out subsystem uh, fault tolerance with the Bacon Shore code, um, which gives 1.94 times 10 to negative fourth. I guess I should do 0.94, you know, for the sake of precision, I guess. Um, and then I picked out the Fibonacci scheme for fault tolerant quantum computation, which gives a 1.25 times 10 to the negative third uh, error rate requirement. Uh, so then if I plot these, you can see the following information. Uh, you can see I just plotted them as lines written and written the text next to them. Uh, where this is the uh, log quantum volume is the intersection. So what does this tell us? One, this tells us for a variety of codes what the log quantum volume is needed. Keep in mind, this is a necessary condition, not a sufficient one. This means even if we have a log quantum volume of 334, this does not mean we can make fault tolerant quantum computers because log quantum volume of 34 means we have only 34 qubits. That is not enough under, I think, any scheme to make a full-scale fault tolerant quantum computer because we obviously want thousands of logical qubits and we don't even have thousands of physical. So that's the important thing to keep in mind. But the other important thing to keep in mind is to say, let's assume, you know, uh, things continue on as they have. Uh, different quantum companies have pledged different timelines, but a common trend is to pledge, I think IBM and Quantinium have both done, is to double every year the quantum volume, which is an ambitious goal that I think both of them have so far stuck to. Uh, but what does that mean? That means an increase of a log quantum volume by one every year. Uh, let's assume they're really good. They not just double it, but quadruple it every year, which is crazy uh, to set a timeline and beat that timeline by two every year. So that's a log quantum volume increase of two every year. So I said state of the art is uh, five, uh, 15, sorry. That means we are between, you know, and, and there's other potentials on here, but we're between 20 you know, 35 minus 15 is 20 and 210 away. So assuming we have an increase of two per year, that means this benchmark would be 10 years away. If we're quadrupling our quantum volume every year, we are 10 years away from this scheme's minimum log quantum volume for fault tolerance. And that means we are 105 years away from this setup, assuming quadrupling every year. So that's, you know, interesting, I guess. Um, you don't do with that information what you will, but the other important thing to note is that this emphasizes number of qubits a lot more than I expected, uh, because what this means is that the quality of qubits, uh, assuming these companies stick to their roadmaps, which may or may not happen, is, you know, uh, as, assuming, you know, we can do it with this, these earlier sort of setups is between 10 to 50 years away. Um, so that's maybe further or sooner than some people might expect it to come. But the important thing is that this is like the minimum requirements. This is like when our qubits will be good enough to do fault tolerance is, is sort of my, or, or our gates will be good enough, whatever. But we still need tons of qubits to work with here. And so previously I've sort of dismissed improvements in qubit count as purely sort of meaningless number increases until we get quality up. But we need, uh, if you look at sort of the doubling or, or the scale of increasing number of qubits, we're going to need to really keep that up as well. If, you know, we want a million qubits in 10 years, 
we have 400 right now, you know, you got to keep that rate up. And you can look, uh, this is going to be very interesting to see, I think, in the next couple years. I think you're going to sort of see the making or breaking pretty soon of these devices because both ion traps and superconducting qubits are reaching the limits of single device possibilities. Uh, as you see on IBM's roadmap, next year they're supposed to put out, I don't forget what it's called, I have it up, Condor, a 1000 qubit single chip system, but that is the last, at least on their roadmap, single chip improvement that I see in terms of number of qubits. What's going on after that is you can't just keep making chips bigger and shoving more and more qubits on them because of the control electronics and all sorts of stuff. But what you can do is some sort of modularity. And this is something ion traps will have to deal with as well. Uh, and so, but that modularity is very new and largely untested in any sort of production environment as far as I'm aware of. So that's either gonna work or it's gonna be interesting and not work basically and that that'll come out in uh, IBM at least has interconnects on Heron and Flamingo in the next two years so those are things to check out definitely uh, and see if that works out because if modularity is super easy then those qubit counts might keep increasing to the point that we need but if modularity becomes super hard like you have to think about can we reach those qubit counts that we need even if we reach quality. Now, I don't know. I am always uh, an optimistic, you know, cynic, but uh, I thought overall this was interesting sort of for me to do. This is, you know, fun to make. I spent a lot of time sitting down and um, writing this all out and thinking, you know, what, uh, what does this actually mean? And you might still say this is a complete garbage comparison and it means absolutely nothing. Uh, but, but I think it's still of some value because quantum volume is inherently some measure of a quantum computer's quality, and we need certain quality devices for fault-tolerant quantum computing. So there's a connection there. Um, it's just that this is a sufficient condition, or sorry, just it's just that this isn't a sufficient condition. It's necessary, the quality is, but it's not sufficient uh, scale. So that's sort of... Um, all I have in this video, uh, of course, all the papers and code will be linked below. <clears throat> but hopefully you thought this was as interesting as I did. And, um, you know, if you're, a, <laughs> if you're a math wizard or just slightly better at it than I am, you could probably derive some of this uh, sort of analytically. And maybe someone has, but I looked for it. I couldn't find any sort of analysis like this. Uh, so there you go. To answer the question, what quantum volume is necessary for fault-tolerant quantum computing, the answer, of course, I'm saying what log quantum volume, the answer is somewhere between 35 and 235. Feel free to check out this. And if you have other codes, these are all kind of old papers. So if you have more recent ones, you can put them in the comments. You can run them. I can run them, post the results. You know, I'm genuinely interested in seeing what other codes log quantum volume requirements are. Um, but that's it for this video. And yeah.